it splits, it cracks, it's got faults all through it. It moves, it won't stop moving. But that's part of the beauty of it as well. Most people would agree that timber is a beautiful material, but working with it can drive you crazy. You're working with something which is living that you can work with all the different difficulties and actually hopefully use them to your benefit and bring out the beautiful colour and grain and, and each one's, each piece of timber is different and uh, so that's all, it's the complexity of it I guess which appeals to me. Laura designs and makes timber furniture. Later in this program we'll see how she makes a wooden screen. But first, she has a client to see about an outdoor bench. So outdoor furniture has to be made a certain way because it's going to age and weather in the elements. The piece that we deliver on the day is going to look distinctly different from how it's going to look in two, three, five, mm. ten years' time. I think time. that's what we were looking for, something that will age very nicely. Yeah. Um, timber that will not dry and crack. and it's just. Yeah. Some... Australian eucalypts are very good for that. We should be able to find something that looks really beautiful. Okay. The main thing to keep in mind is that it's better to have a slatted top because as the timber expands and contracts with the mm. ageing, it's prone to splitting open. So it's better to start with a slatted top. Did you have an idea of overall idea of um, dimensions? Well, it need to be able to seat two people comfortably or three with a squeeze. And, and so not, if you're going to have not something too chunky. Laura likes to get some ideas down on paper as soon as she can after meeting her client. She starts with some rough sketches based on her notes. If it's a piece built to a client's specification, the function is the most important to me. Because at the end of the day, if the piece isn't used regularly and people don't enjoy using it, it's not doesn't succeed as a piece of furniture. I also tend to want to make pieces that are going to age nicely because I don't believe that timber should be a consumable. I don't believe that, you know, furniture should be a consumable, like a fashion item. I don't want my furniture to be like that. I don't think it's right. <laughs> the design sketches are taken further on the drawing board where Laura drafts up some measured drawings. The drawing process helps you understand how much timber you're going to need. The quoting process actually makes you quantify. I'll be able to phone up the timber yard and say I need one piece of 1.5 length black butt in 300 by 50 mil. I prefer to go to the timber yard so that I can actually pick through the timber and find a piece that I like. It's one of the basic things is making sure that you choose the right timber for the job. It's not just about colour or grain, although that does come into it. It's about everything. It's about the price of the timber, the availability, the ethical implications of what timber you use. I'm making an outdoor bench seat and I was thinking about tallow wood. Yeah, well tallow wood would be the perfect choice. Um, weathers beautifully. Um, to a nice grey, nice yes, silvery grey. Yes, it will do. Um, and it'll last sort of a lifetime. And what lengths are you chasing? Uh, I need two, well if it's, this is 300, I'd need two pieces at 1.5. Two pieces at 1.5, okay, well um, this one here looks fairly clean on that face. Yeah. Um, let's have a, another look at the other face. It doesn't really need finishing, does it, because it's got so much oil in it? That's exactly right. The oil within the timber is, is what will sort of make it age beautiful. Uh -huh. That one there, that board there, has just got a little bit of muck in the, under, in the under face there. But what we have got... It's 1.5 to the centre of that, so it's probably no good from that end. No. But we can probably get one off this end. Um, and then we'll just have a look at another board, if yeah. you like. The first thing I do, and it's quite an exciting part of the process, is to dress one of the faces. You can actually see what sort of temper it is that you've bought. The jointer is used to dress one face of the timber to a good even surface. And then to dress one edge at right angles to that face. What you need is to get a really good 90 degree angle off the jointer. Once you've got one 90 degree angle, you can take parallel faces off that and you know you've got a true board all round. 
The thicknesser is used to dress the opposite sides of a piece of timber parallel to each other. The end result is a board that is smooth and square on all sides. What I'm after eventually is 35 by 35 mil square pieces, which I'll be able to use for the main frame of the bench and use for the slats at the top. So I'll take it to the bandsaw and rip it down into lengths. I've dressed it all around so it's got four clean faces. I've picked through and chosen the pieces that I want to be the top of the bench, and I'm just about ready to dock it to length. The square pieces are docked to length on the table saw. I'm going to be doing some shaping of the slats for the top to take off the angle on the edge and the ends to give that 45 degree bevel. It gives the piece a lightness without compromising on the strength of the slats. To take that angle off the side visually, your eye is only going to read the 10 mil lip, which I leave, so it's going to look like the top itself is only 10 mils thick. Well, I've docked all the pieces to length, so we've got four legs, four short cross members, two pieces which will be used, I'll be putting cross halving joints through, which will support the, the top and three long pieces. So effectively I'll be making two leg sections with mortise and tenon joints through here. And then I've got the three long sections which are going to support the top through there. There'll be one piece through here, one through here, and one through there. The type of joint that Laura uses to put the main frame of the bench together is the mortise and tenon. It's a really good traditional joint. I will be using glue, but that's a secondary thing. The main force of the joint is going to be the mortise and tenon. The mortise is the hole in one of the pieces of timber. It's made using a mortising bit on a drill press. The tenon is the tongue on the other piece of timber that fits into the mortise. You want to get a really nice clean shoulder on all four edges of the tenon, which is what I do on the table saw. If your piece of timber's not square, it won't line up. You then take it to the bandsaw and cut the cheeks off, which will leave you with the tenon. Now all the pieces of the mainframe are ready to go together. In this case I'm going to be using epoxy resin, which is a two-part glue. The main reason I'm using that glue is because it is an outdoor piece. It's going to have to be a very, very strong glue that's going to wear well. The qualities that we've chosen the tallow wood for, the fact that it's going to weather well and it's got a high wax and oil content, is actually works against us when coming to glue because it's difficult timber for glue to penetrate. While the glue's drying, Laura prepares the slats for the top of the bench. They'll be connected to the main frame using a cross halving joint. For this, you remove half the thickness from the top piece of wood and the same from the bottom piece. Laura uses a router to clean up the joint. When the two pieces come together, one fits snugly into the other. The most important part of the top is the cross halving joints on the support rails that defines the location of each slat and its distance from each other. I put them together, make sure it's a nice tight fit and I'll pre-drill and screw from underneath just as a, an extra precaution. Uh, once I've got the top screw together, I'll then attach the top to the base.
Usually I'll put a coat of grapeseed oil just to give it a shop finish so that when I deliver it to the client, it looks beautiful and, and shiny. With the bench out of the way, Laura can get to work on her own project, the screen. It's called the barcode screen because it looks like a barcode, but it was also through driving out on the freeway and going through gum forests and seeing the trees as they line up and as you go past the car, you know, you see this sort of slatted effect. Laura's back at the timber yard, looking for the right wood to use for the screen. It's an indoor piece, so it's not going to weather in the same way. As there's no glued joints, I am able to use timbers which are traditionally are difficult to glue. And some of these timbers have what some people would consider faults in, in there's a big range of colour difference or, or gum veins through it, which actually, in the case of the screen, is going to give it a much more visual interest. Yep, absolutely. Well, the black butter be fantastic for what you're trying to do. Now, as far as no finishing goes, you mean no oil? I thought I might put a little bit of maybe china wood oil on it, but not no okay. sort of nitrocellulose or polyurethane. Yep, and it's staying inside? Yeah. Yep. Black yeah. butter will be fine. What I, the other bit I need is to know, know that the boards are going to be really nice and, and straight. Mm -hmm. um, How they look down the line. That looks, that looks good. That looks fine. Mm -hmm. After cleaning up and squaring the timber, Laura rips it on the bandsaw into four different widths. These will be the slats for the screen. Each one is then run through the thicknesser to make sure it's exactly 10 mil thick and square, of course. Well, once I've got all the pieces cut to exactly the same length, I can set up a stop on the drill press and reference from one edge to where I want the first hole to fall and do the same on every single piece of timber and the holes will all line up. It's a few hundred holes later, and now all the pieces are clamped together so they can be sanded. They also have to be arrested, which means sanding along their four edges to remove the sharp corners. Finally, Laura can start threading the stainless steel cables through the timber slats. There's uh, little rubber spaces in between each piece of timber and differing numbers of rubber spaces in between. So it's a random process. Being a designer and maker is important because having the skills of making, bringing that to the design process means that you design something that is made properly. There's something nice about being involved in the whole process from beginning to end, from going to the timber yard to opening up the timber to making the joints and sanding it and finishing it and packaging it up and getting it out of your workshop at the end of that process and delivering it to the client. That's just really nice to be able to be part of that whole process.